amazing introduction. Hi, Tony. Wow. So much bigger. Yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for coming and, and speaking with me today. It's great to be here. Um, he's coming at a really important time. His wife is just about to give birth, so uh, he's about to become a dad. So luckily she hasn't gone into labor, so you're able to make it, so thank you very much. Maybe we'll get a real-time notification. Yeah. <laughs> um, that would be exciting. Okay, so DoorDash, you guys are doing very well. Everybody, I hope everybody knows what DoorDash is, food delivery, yes? Everyone knows. Um, you guys have raised nearly a billion dollars now um, in funding. You've had 250% growth in the last year. You're nearly gonna be in 2,000 cities by the end of this year. You've got new business, DoorDash Drive, where you're working with Walmart. You've done lots and lots of stuff, so we can just get right into it. Very, very important business. Um, now, let's see, let's talk first about your funding. Now, you guys have recently, it was just a few weeks ago, really, you announced um, like 250 million round um, from, uh, from a couple of investors. And you said, I believe at the time, that you didn't actually need to raise the money. So why did you? What are you guys doing? Yeah, it, it was an opportunistic financing. And it, it really came as a result of the strong performance of the company. Uh, you know, the company, we've been the fastest growing service in the US you know, for the past year, and we're actually the largest um, west of the Mississippi. And most of our launch efforts that you were alluding to earlier are actually happening now on the East Coast. And I think investors started paying attention. And you know, folks from CO2 and DST, who co-led the round, reached out. And we weren't really looking for the financing at the time, but I've known um, the, the, the folks at those uh, firms for a while now. And it was a great way to, to formalize the relationship. Yeah, I mean, do you think that like, it helps shore you, yourself up for competition going down the line and so on, to just have that money in the bank just in case? Or are you using that money? Well, we're not spending it all at once, yeah. but, but it certainly allows us to be a lot more flexible and aggressive in how fast we want to accelerate. We, yeah. ha we have a lot of plans. Um, you know, launching to 2,000 cities in the U.S. is no small feat, and that's already 400 ahead of the milestone we laid out uh, in March, which was when we announced the Series D. Yeah. We have a lot of new products we want to add to connect merchants and consumers. We launched our subscription program. Uh, about a month ago, uh, a pickup service to connect um, the, uh, the hundreds of thousands of merchants to the consumers in you know, 2,000 cities. And we have a lot of work to do on our logistics platform. So there's a, there's a lot of work ahead. I'm just looking at the clock. OK, um, one of those things is, I think, DoorDash Drive, right? Yes. Now, you're working with Walmart now. And you're doing more than just food delivery now. I mean, you're doing, rather than restaurant delivery, you're doing other kinds of products, other kinds of food. Um, why did you decide to do that? Is it because food is too hard, too competitive, or what? Well, it's always been the ambition of DoorDash to build the most sophisticated and the broadest uh, logistics platform of, of any kind, really. If you, and we've always had the belief that if you can deliver ice cream in 10 minutes or sandwiches in 30 minutes, you certainly can deliver you know, things like groceries, which is the partnership that, we're, that you're alluding to with Walmart, um, in an hour. And, and it was a very natural extension of, of the work. Um, and, you know, actually, DoorDash Drive really came about a couple years ago when the restaurants on the DoorDash platform started calling us and asking, is there a way that we can actually build our own delivery business? And so, it, yes, we've partnered with Walmart and launched you know, grocery across 20 states and 300 stores. We've also done this with the restaurants on the platform, with people like Chipotle, for example, where they just rolled out their nationwide um, app update that allows you to order delivery through their own app, and we power all of those deliveries. OK, now if you're going to be doing restaurants and Walmart um, with DoorDash Drive, what other kind of businesses do you think you might move into or areas um, could, could use DoorDash Drive? Like, what, what, where, where are you going next? Well, we're building something that's never been done before, which is we're removing the idea of location from retail, um, you know, including restaurants. It used to be that you know, you'd have to be on Main Street USA in order to get enough foot traffic so that people would pay attention and care about your store. 
in the future, as we think about the two types of things that stores will be selling, uh, one of which is the experience, but the other of which, which is growing very quickly, is the convenience. Something like DoorDash Drive allows us to work with all of these different stores. And our goal is to open up to the consumers in every city all of the, the different merchants inside where they live. Do you think that that might translate into you guys doing other kinds of things too? So I, I mean, I think about fashion. So, so fashion retail has largely been banked around going into physical stores. Now companies like Amazon are really moving to push it online. But you have all these really interesting markets, um, you know, like India and so on, where people actually get these things delivered. They try them on, and the guy or woman who's delivering will actually wait and see how the, the outfit looks. And if it's no good, they can take it back. Would you guys ever move into that sort of thing, do you think? Or try to push out new, new sorts of models out of this whole thing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that having a logistics platform that enables a 30-second interaction at the door, you know, in every household, it is really the reinvention of different types of businesses. And, and I think when you think about the future of retail in, in the example you gave, or in the future of, of food, you're really going to have you know, these two bifurcated experiences. You're always going to want people who want to go inside of a store. We're still social creatures. We're still going to hang out with our coworkers and our friends and our families and eat out. We're still going to go try on things at the mall. I think people forget that the offline world is actually 10 times larger or as large as the online world. And it has been that way for a period of time. And I think that's still because we're social creatures. And I think the other thing that's growing very, very quickly is, well, how do we actually meet consumers where they are, whether it's in their home, in their office, at a park, uh, wherever, and really you know, deliver upon that. And I think the most uh, forward-looking retailers and restaurants are already doing this. They are redesigning their kitchens so that more of that space is dedicated to production of food versus you know, seating. Um, there are retailers out there reinventing the layouts of their stores so that they can both serve an in-store showroom experience like the one you described, as well as offering convenience um, at a scale and at a level of quality that's never been delivered before. So I live in London, and we've got um, a, another food delivery company there, um, Deliveroo, um, and they have started doing this interesting thing where they've got these kitchens that where they make the food for their various restaurant customers to kind of speed up the efficiency and basically to separate the restaurant kitchen to serve the restaurant itself and then to outsource the food making into their delivery kitchens. Is that something that you guys do now or would you ever move into that sort of thing or what do you think about that? We have been testing uh, yeah. DoorDash kitchens to allow merchants who have run out of capacity effectively to keep growing. Uh, for us, however, you know, our, our vision has always been, you know, from day one and remains to be today, to be the last mile network for all businesses. And so uh, our primary focus is, is less really around the production of the food. We want to leave the awesome uh, merchandising as well as the inventory uh, that all the makers and the builders across you know, the many cities uh, in, in the world um, to keep doing what they love while we can bring their products back and forth to the consumers. Okay. Okay, you mentioned last mile. Now, you guys have been doing a ton of expansion. I think you're, in, you're going into lots of Florida this week. Is that right? Yeah. We, we, yeah. Well, we're in 1,200 cities today, and, yeah. and, and today we launched 60 cities in Florida. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, Tallahassee thanks you. <laughs> um, they should thank the team doing hard work. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I, I, thought, I was thinking a lot about that. I was thinking about the money you raised and about how you get all these other companies like yours. It's very capital intensive business generally. Um, how are you guys doing this? I mean, is, is it, it, does it cost you an arm and a leg every time you expand? Is it a very capital intensive process or are you guys finding it getting more and more efficient? You know, take us through how you do, how, how you manage it without, you know, spending all your money. <laughs> So we've always had a belief at DoorDash that you first have to start small before you can scale very quickly and very big. And in, in effect, that's the practice and the approach we take to any uh, practice at the company, including launch. So you know, at first, it was really the core team, myself included, you know, launching markets to, market to market. And in fact, we found 
just about any market would actually work for the business. And soon we developed a set of practices and was able to formulate it into literally a list of you know, 50 activities of what to do to launch a market so that we can do it in our sleep. And now we've actually been able to automate a lot of that activity. So our launches are actually getting faster. We're getting more capital efficient. So it's, and, and we're getting to profitability faster in each one of those markets. OK. Um, we're going to come back to profitability. Um, and we're going to come back to this in a minute um, also. But you're basically doing it on your own steam. You're not ever looking to just acquire to move into markets, right? Our, our primary focus has always been launching uh, on our own. Okay. And, and I've, you know, look, if, if there were um, acquisition opportunities that are truly accretive to the business and move the needle for DoorDash, we certainly would be open to it. Right. That opportunity we haven't seen, uh, but you know, who knows in the future? OK, well, you know, there's been one acquisition that you guys have been connected to, um, just a rumor. But I'm going to have to ask you about it. Um, so I, I've read, and you know, there have been murmurs that you, know, you guys have talked to Postmates, which is a you know, company that very similar to yours, doing very similar delivery of food and so on. Um, any, any comments on that? Again, you know, I think if there were opportunities where there were um, businesses that could be very accretive um, to ours, we certainly would be interested in, in taking a look. We haven't seen the opportunity to date, um, and as a result, you know, we've been very heads down building our business. Is it true that you guys were talking or your investors were trying to get you to merge or anything? Well, I, th I think conversations you know, among investors happen quite often, but you know, for the folks at DoorDash, it's always been heads down building the business. Right. But so was that a yes? <laughs> it, 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 we've been just focused on you know, making sure that the, the merchants, dashers, and consumers OK, are so well no satisfied. comment on whether Postmates and DoorDash have ever discussed a merger or anything like that. No. I think you should speak with investors about that. OK. <laughs> right. Um, well, on the subject of that, I mean, there have been actually, I, you know, I heard a million times about all of these rumors of, you know, acquisitions and mergers between companies. Another one that constantly gets mentioned is, is Deliveroo in London. So have you guys looked at, you know, either trying to merge or partner with companies to move internationally? Because it's very notable that you've totally just stayed in, in, in North America, really. So. Where are you going internationally? We are, so today we are live in the US and Canada, and yeah. we have a lot of work to do in both markets. Yeah. Um, you know, nor North America is a very large geography, and the business is very hyper local. So just because we launched in City A in, 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 in Canada does not mean that City B knows about us, and yeah. similarly here in the US. And so our primary focus has been really on North America, remains to be the focus um, for yeah. the next 12 months. So no, no, um, no plans to try to go ab abroad beyond, beyond North America then? We're, we'll look. Um, we've always um, been preparing ourselves, both from an operational perspective as well as a technology platform, to be able to uh, go global anywhere. OK. And so you would like to eventually consider that? Sure. Yeah. I, 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 and you know, again, though, in this business um, where y you have to both think about the top line and the expenditure, uh, very, very carefully, the sequencing of the activities are very important. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you guys have got, um, you know, Postmates. I mentioned Deliveroo. There are some pretty big competitors in this space. Um, there's Uber Eats. There's Amazon. Seamless. Um, what is your? Who, who do you see as your biggest competition? And you're not allowed to say going to eat at the restaurant itself. <laughs> that is not, you're not allowed to answer that. Well, it, it, so, so <laughs> I, I, think it, I think it's important to know where we are in an industry whenever we talk about competition. Because I think otherwise, it's very easy just to look at whatever is around us and then just deem that as the you know, competition. You know, 40 years ago in this country, only 4% of pizza sales were delivered. Today, if I ask you to you know, have pizza with me, Delivery probably is the first thing that comes to mind. Today, about you know, almost half of pizza sales are delivered today. But 4% just 40 years ago. And, and if you look at where non pizza. Wait, you said only 4%? Yeah, 40 years ago. And so, I can't even believe And, and, and that. so today, you yeah. know, if you look outside of pizza, you know, about 6%, you know, yeah. by certain people's estimates, between 5 and 8% are actually delivered. And so we are in a super early 
phase of the market's life. And, and I know it, it's, it's uh, tempting to talk about you know, all of the peers, but you know, there's a lot of market out there. And, and I think what's happening to both restaurants and retail is very transformative. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because in, in the European market, there's been a, like a ton of consolidation. But you get, you get these like, um, companies like Delivery Hero, you know, and they, they basically chomp up, gobble up uh, all of their competitors in all the different markets. They become these kind of like huge leviathons covering lots of territories and so on. It's a very different approach to you guys, which is a quite organic uh, growth, you know. I yeah, I, I think, well, I think you see the leaders emerging in the U.S. I mean, DoorDash now works with more of the top 100 restaurants than all of our here yeah. combined, and and you know, and again, being the largest you know west of the Mississippi, we certainly are, are among that set. And and I think you know you're going to see a very small handful emerge, just as you saw in other yeah. parts of the world. How are you guys um, getting the upper hand in those Chipotle deals and so on? Well, we've always had. Do you give them cuts, and is is it about commissions that you guys give, or? I think if you're making everything just about price, you probably don't have a business. Right. Um, you know, for us, it's always been about how do we deliver more service and more more value to these businesses. And you know, I, I think one of the things that might be helpful to explain is that these um, these larger restaurants that you're uh, referencing. They are very sophisticated companies, you know, public businesses that do tens of billions of dollars of revenue, not just market cap, but revenue. And, you know, they effectively run, you know, their own diligence processes where they have mystery shoppers across various cities that will make thousands of orders um, across a list of criteria amongst the companies here in the U.S. and make their decision. And, you know, 70% of the time they've chosen DoorDash. And, 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 and so I think, I think these decisions are, um, are really based on the quality of the service. And so I think it starts there. And then further, it's really about the different other services that we help these businesses with, whether it's going to market, adding other ways and connecting them to their own consumer as well as new consumers uh, acquired from the DoorDash right. platform. Okay, so you, you mentioned something first, which was the quality of the service you guys are giving. Now, you guys are like a lot of these organizations that do delivery and other logistics services. You work with a lot of contractors. Now, the contractors, um, there's been you know different disputes and so on. I know that you guys did a settlement in 2017, which was a significant settlement that you'd done over some of the labor disputes. Would you say that all of that is now behind you guys? Have, are you guys kind of moving ahead or...? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think you know the the partnership with the hundreds of thousands and soon millions of dashers on the platform is very very important. And, and I think you know all of the companies, not just actually in the quote unquote gig economy, but also in many industries, whether it be insurance, restaurants, yeah. warehousing, retailers, any any industry that. Uh, have had work and partnerships with contractors are, are all going through this phase of um, figuring out how to co-create the future of work. Uh, DoorDash is, you know, doing this with a coalition of companies actually right now with uh, uh, local uh, officials, regulatory bodies, and figuring out how do we keep the flexibility that all of these contractors love. Uh, and at the same time, make sure that there's a security for them in a way that makes sense for all parties. So you think longer term, it's never going to evolve into employees. You think this, there's a place for long-term contract in, in this sort of uh, business model? Well, I, I, I think that the data suggests the vast majority of the dashers on the platform and, and folks who participate in other gig economy uh, work they love the flexibility. They already have a daytime job. Right. They're looking to augment you know, other opportunities. The question is, how do we take some of the you know, um, legislature that was written a, a, a long time ago when a lot of these companies and industries, again, in, in, in many sectors, not just tech, um, have been, uh, and figure out the path forward because now we have something that didn't exist, you know, exactly. many decades ago. Yeah. How do we actually make it work for everyone? Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, we're, we're talking about tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions 
of opportunities. So this is a very, very important topic. Yeah. Okay. So I know one of the things that happens when you have employees versus contractors is it definitely impacts the margins of the business. Speaking of margins, are you guys profitable? You said you're profitable in some markets. Um, yeah. Our earliest, our, our earliest markets have been profitable for okay. a while now. And, you know, every market that we've launched, uh, you know, since really in the last three years have gone to profitability way sooner. The company as a whole has been contribution margin positive for six straight quarters. And so um, we've figured out how to scale a model and get the unit economics right in one market. And, and we did that before actually raising any of our financing, right. in, including both the Series D and the Series E. Right. That must be one of the reasons why I think a lot of the investors are coming at you guys, too. Well, I mean, you, you have to you know, understand, these, these investors um, have the pick of the lot. You know, these, yeah, these exactly. I mean, there's so many companies. have looked at every single company in yeah. the world, in this space, in adjacent spaces, and in orthogonal spaces. And you know, they believe that DoorDash has the most capital efficient metrics and also have grown the fastest at the same time. That's great. Does that mean you guys will go public soon or stay private? Well, the, the goal of the company has always you can tell us, been right? to become yeah. an independent business, yeah. and, 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 and we are today. And, and, and you know, to us, uh, whether it, it, it's you know, a public offering um, uh, uh, or staying private, um, as long as we can maintain that state of independence. I mean, do you think you have to go public eventually? Do you think that's the natural progression of these things? Or I do think that's a part of the journey, and, yeah. and I think the timing for that really doesn't change. I mean, the ambitions for the company are very, very long. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in many ways, they're much, much longer than you know, any state of financing. Right. So, but this probably means you would go public I mean, you're how, what's the series you've done now? Was it Series E? We did a Series E. E, yeah. So it's, um, I mean, but you've been around since 2012 or 11? 13. 13. We were founded okay. June of 2013, five okay. years old. Okay. So would you say that you're a rev relatively mature company at this point, getting ready for IPO, or would you say you're still some years away from it? I would say we're a company where the business metrics are far ahead of, uh, of where we yet are organizationally. You know, I, I think we're still, uh, you know, formulating, you know, many of the teams, yeah. many of the teams at DoorDash that will exist in the next couple of years, you know, aren't even there yet. You, right. know, you know, one of the biggest things that we're trying to do right now is really to build the team. Yeah. You know, we, um, we're going to add 300 people this year um, in, in terms of corporate staff. Um, so we have a lot of building to do. Okay. Thank you. We're out of time. But thank you so much. It's really cool of you to come, especially with your wife just about to of course. become a mom. <laughs> so Great to see you again. Anyway, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.